Hello. On behalf of the Pennsylvania Coalition Against Rape, I'd like to welcome you to part three of our three-part series on working with trafficking survivors who may be experiencing complex trauma. Today, we'll be talking about trauma-informed care for trafficking survivors, a framework for healing complex trauma. And with us today, we have our presenter, Heather Evans. And Heather is a licensed clinical social worker with a private counseling practice in Coopersburg, Pennsylvania. She has over 17 years experience providing individual marriage and family therapy to children, adolescents, and adults in inpatient, outpatient, nonprofit, and residential settings. She has extensive training and experience with women's issues, particularly sexual trauma. Her training includes sex trafficking and aftercare of its victims. Heather is co-founder and acting board chair of VAST, the Valley Against Sex Trafficking Coalition in the Lehigh Valley, Pennsylvania. Heather has served as clinical advisor to The Truth Home, a therapeutic home for women with a history of sexual exploitation. In 2013, Heather received the Allied Professional Award from Crime Victims Council of the Lehigh Valley for outstanding commitment to victim services. Heather has also traveled nationally and internationally with the goal of partnering with and training tra trauma healing caregivers. Welcome, Heather. Thank you so much. Thank you for participating in this webinar. So as you can see, this is part three, and we encourage you to first view parts one and two, which will make this presentation, presentation more rich. In part one, we actually laid out the aspects of complex trauma. And may I remind you that complex trauma is um, when there is premeditated, interpersonal, repetitious trauma of an individual, so something of an ongoing nature, such as the trauma of sex trafficking. There are six disturbances and areas of function for complex trauma that include affect regulation, attention or consciousness, self-perception, relations with others, somatization, and systems of meaning. That is really unpacked in part one and part two. This time, we're really going to be focusing more on the specific aspects of care. I just want to remind you to take care of yourself throughout this presentation. If there's content that tends to be overwhelming, I think that the more overwhelming content was in part one and two, but please take care of yourself as um, we delve into such a difficult topic. I'm also um, thankful to have the opportunity to be delving a little bit into some of my research that I'm in the midst of right now. Um, I've done research for my dissertation on domestic sex trafficking survivors, particularly looking at their experiences and the impact as well as what's helpful and not helpful during their post-trafficking experience. And this, um, we conducted interviews as well as photo voice. So I'll be referring to some parts of the interviews as well as um, sharing some photo voice with you during this portion. So again, let's look at our goal for today. There we go. Let me just go back one slide. So our goal for the day, or this for this portion, is to explore key components of trauma-informed care that are necessary for victims of human sex trafficking, including we'll look at some therapeutic themes and some specific interventions for complex trauma. So we're really wanting to unpack this idea of trauma-informed care. What does it mean that we look through the lens of trauma when we consider the uh, victimization of a sex trafficking survivor? And I love this quote to start off. Steve and Celeste Tracy have um, done some work with, with sex trafficking survivors. They've written a book on sexual abuse as well as some resources for sex trafficking. And this is what they say. So it's kind of a very wordy, meaty quote, but I, I, I hope it will lay a foundation for us. The treatment of trauma must not be confined to a professional, medical, or psychological response but instead understood as a relational process. A community-based model of care understands healing not as the domain solely belonging to, uh, solely, excuse me, belonging to a handful of experts, but as a holistic community task in which numerous individuals within the context of various healthy relational communities 
utilize their unique skills and gifts to facilitate restoration. As you can see, there's a lot there. But what I want you to take away from this is, first of all, the idea of healing or the treatment of trauma being a relational process. As we've said numerous times in part one and two, the healing process, the restoration process, should be the opposite of the trauma experience. So if trauma isolates, then healing should occur as a relational process in the context, context of community. Specifically, I, the other part I want you to really look at in this quote is how we need all kinds of individuals. A survivor of trafficking really needs a community, a support network. So it's not just about referring her to professionals. In fact, she could very easily slip through the crack of traditional social services. We need to be creative, relational, in how we provide a context, a community context in which she can heal. We've, we've talked before about this holistic impact from complex trauma. So the healing process must also be holistic. And these things impact each other. This just gives you a visual. It gives you the breakdown to say, OK, if I am an agency, if I'm an individual, if I'm a community, if I'm a region, and I'm seeking to further address how do we intervene in the lives of sex trafficking survivors, then we better have resources for each of these things. We better have resources or be thinking about how do we creatively fill in the gap so that each of these things are provided for a sex trafficking survivor. So now let's kind of lay the foundation of what do we mean when we use this term trauma-informed. SAMHSA is an organization that has created so that's the Substance Abuse Mental Health Administration, I'm forgetting one word, um, but they have laid out some aspects of trauma-informed care, and they have a lot of great resources on their website. Um, to, if you want to further understand trauma-informed care or be an organization that's really considering that. Right now, I'm just kind of laying out the principles for you because they lay a foundation that's important for us. Later on in the, this presentation, we'll be talking about more like the therapeutic themes if you're a clinician, but clinicians cannot provide supportive services for trafficking survivors in isolation. You simply can't. They need a community. So we have to think about this from a foundational aspect and from a principal aspect. So trauma-informed principles include safety. That includes physical safety, but also emotional and relational safety. How do I go about um, modeling and providing a safe and physical environment, a safe relational environment, and a safe relationship. One, I would say the next guiding principle is one key way that we can provide safety for a survivor by being trustworthy and transparent. That word transparent is like what you see is what you get. It doesn't necessarily mean you're opening up and you're sharing details of your lives with survivors. It just means what you see is what you get. And, so, and think about what we've been talking about in the previous part of these webinars. We've been talking about how they've needed certain skills to survive. You better believe they're very good at reading people. And so they won't be able to pick up on any impure motivation that you may have or any inconsistencies that you may have. So thinking about being trustworthy and transparent as individuals and as an organization. Another um, aspect of trauma-informed care is peer support and mutual self-help. And I will tell you in the, the research I'm in the midst of analyzing, my own research, it's a common theme when asked what has been most helpful. They talk about, survivors often talk about being able to be around their peers, be around other survivors, and how helpful that is to be in environments where they feel understood, they feel known, even in an in unspoken way. Another aspect of um, trauma-informed care is collaboration and mutuality. This is this idea that we are, we are careful how we wear our power. We are careful to um, not have kind of a one-up, one-down perspective, but be collaborative and mutual in the way that we go about providing support trafficking survivor. We come alongside them. 
we are equal. And we'll, we'll unpack that a little bit, a little bit further um, as we go. The fourth person. The guiding principle is empowerment, voice, and choice. So for this, this is talking about how in the care that we provide, are we empowering them? Are we offering choice? Are we promoting voice? As we said, the healing process is always the opposite of the trauma experience. If trauma isolates, if trauma takes away power, mute off. All guests have been muted. Okay. We want done. I'm not sure how, how far I should put that. I'm trying to remember. I think it's fine. I think we should leave it. Tatiana, can you hear us? Yes. We can just or just leave it. Um do you mind starting at the beginning of the slide? No. Because I think that's when they we started being able to hear them. Okay. So now we're going to just kind of look at what um, trauma-informed care actually means. What are the guiding principles? So SAMHSA, on their website, they really lay out some good resources. If you want to understand further how to become trauma-informed in your care as individuals or as organizations. And here are some of the guiding principles that they lay out. First of all, safety. Safety is important in terms of physical safety as well as emotional and relational safety. So we're thinking about the context of our relationship as well as the context of the community or the agencies, the policies, and we're thinking about how we promote a setting of safety. That includes the next guiding principle, trustworthiness and transparency. There are two key aspects of having a safe relationship is can survivors know what to expect from you? And is what they see what they get. So that's what transparency is. That's just kind of idea of what you see is what you get. They're very good at reading people. They've had to do that in order to survive. So they can very easily pick up on inconsistencies, impure motivation, um, balance, in, in, imbalance of power. So trustworthiness and transparency doing what you say you will do as an individual and organization, being who you say you are. The next aspect that I can say in the research that I'm currently doing is a common theme. When asked what is most helpful, they talk about peer support and mutual self-help. When they have the opportunity to be with peers in a survivor retreat or support groups or in residential settings or other types of programs like that, when they get to interact with other survivors, it enables them to feel seen and heard and understood, even in an unspoken way. Um, that idea that we've talked about in the last two portions of, of, of otherness, like just feeling like they're different, that is removed when they're with peers who they know have had similar experiences. Collaboration and mutuality is also very important, and we'll impact this further throughout the rest of the presentation. This is referring to this idea that of how we hold our power as service providers and organizations. Are we collaborative and mutual in the way we come alongside them and offer support and the way that we partner with them as opposed to kind of having a one up, one down position? Um, do we bring them in and offer choice and offer conversation in the services 
provided and in their own care and plan, their own kind of healing journey. The next guiding principle is empowerment, voice, and choice. Again, the trauma experience um, must be, must, we must have the opposite through the trauma healing of the trauma experience. And so if trauma isolates, if trauma takes away voice and trauma disempowers, then are our services offering choice? Are they offering voice? Are we empowering in the way that we go about conducting things? And we'll keep unpacking this. And finally, trauma-informed guiding principles do take into consideration culture, history, and gender, and how those issues come into play in a survivor's life. I want to point out this really great article that's come out in 2017 where they further unpack trauma-informed practices. And what, what I thought was important is this kind of new research. We were relatively young in this field, the anti-trafficking movement. It's relatively young. We're still learning about what's helpful and what's not, what's effective, and we're still, we still have a long way to go in terms of research. But they say the anti-trafficking response um, has to move towards something and give human trafficking survivors something to move toward, not just something from which to escape. So they talk about our his historical rescue and restore perspective in the anti-trafficking movement and the dangers of that. So I think, first of all, that let me go back to that first phrase. It's, it's a paradigm shift. We're moving beyond just thinking about this idea of getting victims rescued or helping them escape. It's important, helping them exit, but first of all, there's so much more that they need than just separation from a trafficker. That's number one. Number two, some of this language could have impact. The rescue and restore perspective. What could that do to us and how we perceive a victim and how we perceive ourselves? When you think about this idea, you think about someone perhaps that's helpless and weak and they need a savior to come and rescue. They need a hero. We're the hero, we're the savior, and they're the weak little um, person that needs us. They don't want to be seen as weak, little. They may not even want to be identified as a victim. And we certainly are doing them damage and a disservice if we identify ourselves as the rescuer, as the, the hero of the story. So the shift is moving to a strength-based perspective where survivor and professionals walk side by side as collaborative partners. I really appreciate this approach. They go on to describe this a term accompaniment, having an accompaniment model. So let's just pick apart this definition for a little bit. A lens through which the worker injects hope into the work, accompanied by a belief that the survivor's difficulty can be overcome through a spirit of worker-survivor collaboration. Together, they develop knowledge, access tools, and set goals within an environment of respect. What stands out to you with this definition? I think, first of all, I think a lot of us gravitate towards that idea of a worker injecting hope into the work. We like that. That resonates with us. That reminds us of our calling, our purpose, and why did we do the work that we do? I think for others, that, you know, that idea of, of a, a spirit, you know, a spirit, it's almost like a setting and an aura of worker-survivor collaboration, that resonates with us. And then the last portion really kind of fleshes out what this looks like to collaborate together. But I will tell you, I mean, if that first phrase, injecting hope, is separated from the rest of the definition, we have a problem. And that word inject can actually sound a little bit forceful. And it doesn't really work to just throw hope on a survivor and just you know, tell them optimistic things and things are going to be okay. It has to be done in a spirit of collaboration. We hold a lot of power as workers. So we, you know, many people go into this work because they feel led or called into it. They're passionate about it. And we come in sometimes with really glamorized ideals of how we're going to help. We, we can end up really, first of all, being disappointed and burning out. The second of all, hurting those we're helping because we end up taking on too much power and not having a collaborative perspective 
where they actually become empowered to set their own goals and within an environment of respect. So this just kind of gives this particular approach, this gives their kind of layout of trauma-informed perspective. I think it's very similar to the SAMHSA principles, but I wanted to just highlight it because I love that idea of the accompaniment model, that, that we are accompaniers. It's even a different word than helper, and it's definitely a different word than rescuer. So to go along with this a little bit more, you know, we've been talking about this idea of offering choice. We've been talking about this idea of being careful of wearing our power. So another aspect of trauma-informed guiding principles is to be, we could say, victim-centered or client-centered. And this is just where we, we kind of actually find out what do they want? How do they want to proceed? Rather than us saying, you need this, and this is how we think you should approach it. We together, again, hand in hand, accompanying them in figuring out what is most helpful and what is least harmful. Now, you know, there may be times there's something that they want to do and we really don't think it's the best for them. So we're faced with that dilemma. How do we use our power well for what's most helpful? But how do we always honor choice? And we proceed in such a way that we're actually getting their feedback and asking them what they want. One of the survivors I interviewed for my research said that I'm under the impression right now that unless it is something a client requests as part of their journey and part of the journey that they want to take, it should not be made a requirement of a program. Think about that. Her perspective, but she's a voice of experience, one who's been there, one who's witnessed. Think about that further as you think about being client-centered and empowering in the way that you go about developing and implementing your program. But the reality is when a survivor is separated from a trafficker, she needs a lot. Some would say that she needs anything and everything. She needs basic safety, basic needs met, safe temporary housing, residential care, trauma-specific counseling. She may need permanent housing vocation and employment, usually something like comprehensive case management to manage all of the different things that she needs. Education, spiritual services, substance abuse treatment, there's a lot. So take this, I mean this is just, this is not all encompassing, but this again, if you are someone who has interest in helping a survivor, you cannot obviously be the be all end all. But you must know and network and partner with other resources in your region that offer some of these things. Sometimes becoming very creative in the way that you go about networking with them. And it's important then to fill in the gap. It may be important to provide additional training for those who be providing some of these resources because as we've been discussing, there's specific nuances and complexities that a trafficking survivor may experience. And it'd be important that wherever you're referring, you have a certain um, confidence that it will be trauma-informed, that they'll be sensitive to the needs of the survivor. This may look familiar to you from psychology or sociology classes. I think this is incredibly relevant when we look at how we care for the needs of a survivor. I mean, you saw this, right? So, you know, if basically Maslow is saying, you have to start with your basic physiological needs. Then you move up to providing a context of safety and security. Then that actually frees an individual up to experience love and belonging within relationships. And then slowly it moves to them, that impacting their sense of self, and then being able to be freed up to address their self-esteem and to come to some point of self-actualization. I think this is extremely relevant. If you look at this list, you see all of the specific needs. For me, I do you know, long-term trauma uh, therapy with survivors. I can't start there if she doesn't know where she's going to sleep tonight. It's kind of common sense, but it's just really important that we don't jump in uh, with the deeper stuff without that basic safety and stabilization. Some of the intangible needs that survivors themselves have said, these are the things we need. These are the things we need for healing. So it's, you know, they need the resources, but again, some of this stuff is just basic human level stuff um, that is actually the whole context 
and what they give the most credit to for what's bringing fear healing. I mean, I will tell you in um, the research I'm currently doing, the greatest theme from survivors in terms of what was helpful for them are someone that intervened, someone to believe in me, someone that was with me for the long haul. Repeatedly, the idea of supportive relationships, whether it be from a social service organization or a family member, a community member, hands down what they attribute to be the most helpful. Here's a quote from my research, one of the survivors. She says this, for loved ones, I would say, be a student of the survivor, because what you see today is not going to be the person that you see tomorrow or in five years. And the people who stuck it out in my life and who have truly, I see as being major people in my life, are the people who've been able to grow with me. And if you had this conversation with me seven years ago, five years ago, it would be a very different conversation. And the first thing that people who love me very deeply will say to me is how much I've grown how much I've matured, and I'm able to walk that life with somebody. It requires students. Keep on being a student. Don't give up. You are truly able to impact individuals deeply. She says a lot to us. Again, just this idea of people who stuck with her being what has been so helpful, and people who agree to be ongoing students, students of her, students of trauma, students of the trafficking experience and that won't give up on her. So in general, um, if we're looking now kind of more therapeutically, what are some of the resources that might be useful? Residential programming is often useful. If you think back to that Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you think about that basic level of um, you know, food, clothing, and shelter. If you can take those things off the table for a survivor, meaning she doesn't have to think about where is she going to find food tonight, where is she going to sleep tonight, you actually then free her up to become emotionally and mentally stable, to begin to learn to cope with her trauma, and maybe to begin to actually delve into and explore what it is she's been through. That's why residential programming can be so useful. Holly Austin Smith wrote a book um, called Walking Prey, and in it, she actually describes how important residential programming was for her, and she describes how she needed a place that actually had was locked down. Um, it was not a juvenile detention facility, it was a residential program, but she describes how much she needed that because she was not even safe, or she couldn't keep herself safe. She describes herself as a runner and someone who lacked the ability to deal with her emotions, and so being in that kind of a contained environment was safe for her. Individual and family therapy are often extremely necessary and useful, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about how you might go about conducting the, the therapeutic needs of a survivor. As we said before, case management can be useful just because there are so many different resources they need and need to navigate. And finally, teaching coping skills, teaching life skills is extremely important. As we've laid out in the first couple of the first parts of our webinar, you see there's developmental need. There was a brain, a learning brain that was hijacked by a survival brain. So there but down to like, you know, how to manage money and create a budget because they were handing over the money to the trafficker. They saw a lot of money coming in. They had nice things bought for them in terms of getting their hair or nails done, perhaps a brand new thing but they had no management of that money. That is a major detriment. When you're coming out, trying to find a job, it typically might be minimum wage, and then you're figuring out how to budget money. That's one example of many coping skills and life skills that are necessary for them to eventually learn. In terms of clinical intervention, here are some different treatment approaches that could be useful. We're going to really unpack this three-phase model today. Um, but somatic experiencing, who I have referred to in part one, Peter Levine, he really just talks a lot about what's going on physiologically, and I think that can be a really great resource. Again, many of the survivors I've interviewed have talked how helpful it was when they had a therapist who taught them about trauma, taught them about the impact on their brain, taught them about the impact on their body and kind of just provided that education, it was extremely empowering. And so the somatic experience really delves into that mind, 
body connection with trauma. EMDR, or eye movement desensitization reprocessing, has been utilized um, by therapists who are working with trafficking survivors, and again, is a useful tool for dealing with the distress of the traumatic memory. You may be familiar with trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy, where you can actually receive free online training. And this is another useful tool. In fact, it has been used worldwide in some residential programs for trafficking survivors. And of course, a strength-based approach is, is a really valuable thing to keep in mind. Again, I believe the trauma-informed perspective and the strength-based perspective go hand in hand. Because if you have these trauma lenses on in which you're seeing the interactions, the behaviors of a survivor, you're, you're not just looking at her saying, what's wrong with her? You're saying there's a reason for what she's doing right now. And you can even see the strength and the resilience in some of the ways that she's responding based on what she survived and based on what she's been. So now let's really unpack this three-phase model. Judith Herman, in her book, Trauma and Recovery, was the first to talk about this three-phase model. Bethel Vanderkolk and another man named Luxembourg have also unpacked this further. Uh, Christine Courtois has written a really great book on complex trauma. And there's an article that can be found online that kind of outlines these three phases. Phase one, safety and stabilization. Again, let me just back up and say um, what we're about to discuss would be really useful if you are a clinician and you're working with complex tra trauma or sex trafficking survivors. I think uh, these phases can also really provide a framework for your programming for trafficking survivors. So just to keep that in mind as well. Phase one, safety and stabilization, is the foundation for all treatment, and it's the longest phase. And it's vital to have positive outcomes. The main features of this phase are building an alliance, a therapeutic alliance with your, your client. Um, and as I said just before, educating them about the nature of trauma and helping them manage versus react to their symptoms. During this, this phase, some of that you know, education should become very individualized. OK, what are your specific triggers that you're aware of? What happens when you get triggered? And then helping them learn to kind of create safety plans, coping skills for starting to deal with um, those traumatic triggers. So during this phase, you're assessing. You're looking for life-threatening issues, self-injury, drug addiction, suicidal ideation, um, maybe even threat from the trafficker. You know, you're looking for life-dominating issues. I don't know where I'm going to sleep tonight. Um, I, um, I'm worried about my children who are in custody. You know, you're dealing with the things that just are all-consuming um, or the things that are destabilizing. Again, providing education, helping them learn skills, helping them understand the therapeutic process, trauma, and boundaries. You're helping them at this point to start to develop a network of support. It cannot be you. You cannot do this work in isolation, nor should you think your agency is the be all end all. Helping them to develop a greater support network is really necessary and helpful. The goals during this phase, safety and stabilization, include um, helping them become more self-reflective helping them develop boundaries in their life and in your therapeutic relationship and explaining those boundaries. This is a new, perhaps an extremely new concept for them, but boundaries are incredibly empowering, incredibly healing, and incredibly stabilizing. So they're necessary. Um, as we've talked about before, we want to just, if there's anything kind of interfering with the therapeutic process, we want to try to problem solve and address that and helping them learn coping skills. Basically, we want them to be able to have mastery over their traumatic responses, their post-traumatic responses. And that really, like you can't really move into phase two without knowing that, without them showing um, that they have some mastery over flashbacks, panic attacks, aggression, uh, self-injury, bad dreams, you know, all of these different things that are destabilizing. You want them, they're not going to be cured, but you want them to have safety plans and some coping skills. So some of the dangers of this phase 
are just diving into trauma work before you build that. And so that might be an error on the therapist part of, you know, being really eager, maybe even self-motivatingly to um, get into the trauma narrative. It may even be the individual who's kind of rushing into addressing that. But we are really the ones that, you, you know, you don't want to be coercive and like, nope, 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 you can't talk about that yet. We're still in phase one. It's not like that. It's helping them understand, okay, like I know this is really important, but here's, here's what I want you to explain. Because it can be very destabilizing for them to talk too soon without guilt to deal with the traumatic traumatic content that's coming up. Another danger is that we never come back to this phase once we get to phase two, which is the trauma memory work. We always have to come back to phase one to help them remember what is your safety plan, what are some of the coping skills you use, what do you do when you're triggered, how can you take care of yourself. Another danger is that the counselor in this phase becomes so reactive to the client or can become enmeshed with the client. And I think this isn't particularly a danger with trafficking survivors because their needs are so complex. And as we said in part one, they can tend to be in survival mode. And so there may be a lot of crises. So as the clinician, it's our responsibility to maintain consistency and maintain boundaries um, and a good, healthy kind of distance and separation um, in order to not become lost and caught up with the confusion and the chaos. Here are some more tangible, specific examples of safety and stabilization. So grounding exercises. This includes, um, you know, I think a basic way to understand grounding would be to think about using your five senses to help you stay present and focused on the here and now. So what do you see? What do you hear? What do you smell? What do you feel? And actually, you know, in your, your office, you may want to have lotions like a lavender lotion or peppermint. Um, you may want to keep Play-Doh that they can play with, something comforting that they can hold on to, a smell that is comforting for them. And your voice can be very grounded. If someone is going to be expressing a traumatic memory, what you don't want is them reliving it and re-experiencing as they do it. You want them retelling it retelling it in the here and now in the context of a safe relationship. And so these grounding exercises you can actually utilize within session, and then they can be tools that they can practice and use outside of session. So you're helping them stay grounded with your voice, with different sounds, smells, or touches, for example, um, to stay in the here and now. It's also very important that relaxation techniques are taught Mindfulness exercises can be taught. These are things that, again, that idea of gaining mastery of your body. Imagine someone that has literally had no mastery of her own body. She's been at the disposal of others. Now she's learning that she can, calm, she can uh, make choices for herself. She can learn to calm her own body down. That, that has to be taught. That has to be practiced. I like to introduce the idea of containment during this phase because many times survivors are afraid of starting to talk about their history because they're so afraid they will unravel. They're so afraid they won't you know, know how to cope with it. The idea of containment is this idea, you know, you think about what do we do with our leftovers after dinner? We put them in a container, we put them in the fridge, we pull them out when we're ready for them again, when we need them again. It's kind of like that. It's helping them learn that they actually have a choice. They could talk about something for a few minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes. Then they can put it away and talk about it another time. Maybe the next time they come to meet with you. Maybe the next day when they have a time, a downtime for self-reflection. It's something we all do. We don't really realize we do it. Um, you know, you may be have something really big and important that on your mind right now or going on in your personal life. And you've said, okay, I can't think about that right now. We want to listen to this webinar. It's like that. It's being able to put something on hold until you can pull it back out again. But that might need to be taught and practiced. And it gives them a sense of empowerment and boundaries over their own memories and their own experiences. Weight management is important. 
um, helping them develop a list of self-care strategies. I guess they may never have even thought that that's like a, I mean, it's, it's a luxury to have, um, to be able to care for yourself. And so this might be an extremely new concept and an important opportunity for you to help them to develop themselves further. Attunement and self-regulation really goes hand in hand with some of these other things. It's being in tune with your mind and your body and, and what's going on and being able to regulate yourself accordingly. And again, can't underestimate this idea of helping them create a safe support system and actually understand what that word safe means. I want to talk a little bit about dissociation during this phase. I think during the safety and stabilization phase is also a time to make them aware of, of what dissociation is. As we talked about in the previous portions, dissociation is so common but they may not have that label for it. And they may not know what to do about it. You know, they'll say, I checked out, I left the building, I just became numb, I just wasn't present. They're describing dissociation. You can help them name it. You can help them understand that dissociation is a survival mechanism. It is an involuntary response of the brain. It kept them alive. It kept them from be their brain from being shattered by what they were enduring. But it also can become a habit that is destructive because if you're dissociated, you can't protect yourself. You can't, you're not present. You may be missing out on good stuff in the present, and you may also be um, making yourself vulnerable because you're not available to protect yourself. So with dissociation, um, it, it's helping them learn grounding, being able to differentiate the past from the present, being self-aware, body aware. The one really powerful way to help them understand association is if you're meeting with them and you see they kind of just left, just pause and just talk about that. Hey, what just happened? Where did you go? What did you see? Did you see anything where you went? You just blank space. Well, you remember what we were talking about? What about that might have been threatening? That's just an example of how you can pause and help them become more aware of when it happens and perhaps what kind of content is triggering. Because remember, if dissociation was used during the trauma experience, if they have something that is like a perceived or a real threat, something stressful, something that seems threatening, whether real or perceived, they may dissociate. So teaching grounding, Helping them to be present is, is really important. And they, over time, especially as they start to deal with some of the memory work, they really can decrease their amount of dissociation. Let's talk about phase two. So in phase two, this is where we're kind of delving more into specific traumatic memory. Remember, we're, we're not leaving behind phase one. We're using those skills that were developed in phase one, our safety plan, self-care plan, we're helping them learn what strategies of self-regulation, relaxation, grounding seem to work the best for them. While we're doing the memory work, we're really focusing on the themes of grief, loss, shame, anger, um, remembering that they tend to dissociate, so we're well aware of that. The goal is doing small amounts of memory work with a lot of self-care and stabilization, and I'm telling you, as a clinician and even as a survivor, it feels really slow. It feels very little by little. They can be frustrated with that. How much longer am I going to have to do this? How long do I have to come to therapy? You may hear that. That's very normal and you're normalizing it and reminding them that you're in for the long haul and also educating them that it typically is a long, slow repetition process. So it, we want it to go slow. Why? We don't want to overwhelm them. We're always going back to safety and stabilization as we talk about the men. Well, why talk about the memories? And this is where this idea comes in where they might say, why do I have to talk about it? And I want to remind you that they don't have to talk about it. You never should force a survivor to talk through her traumatic na uh, narrative. You should never do that in the context of her entering your program. You should not think that that is what is necessary to heal. Too many times that becomes about us, wanting to feel good that someone trusted us with their story and it's not about them. Why? Remember, the, the healing experience 
has to be the opposite of the trauma experience. Therefore, they need choice. They get to decide who they share it with, how much, if, when. You can, however, let them know why it's important or why it would be a good idea for them to talk through their specific memories because it empowers the voice of a silenced experience. It, it helps them improve their self-efficacy. It's basically, it's empowering. It helps them kind of take these fragmented bits and pieces, which you, not, you won't really hear the story from you know, beginning to end. It will typically come out in fragments and bits and pieces. And it kind of helps them bring a little bit of cohesion to that. It helps them grieve, grieve for what they've lost, grieve for what they didn't have, grieve for what they've experienced. But this idea of sharing parts of their story or sharing your memories isn't just about, oh, good, I got that out, I feel better. It's not really for catharsis alone. It's really to be able to identify what is it that they're believing as a result of this. How has this impacted them? What messages were sent to them through this? Experience. And then we look for the distortion. What are they believing that's actually not true? So going back to what we talked about in the previous part, we talked about the trauma bond. We talked about the idea of uh, feeling, I chose this. I'm responsible for this. Um, I believe this is all I'm good for. I believe I'm, too, you know, I'm ashamed of myself, and so I can't fit in to normal life. These ideas of distortion come out that were really shaped by the traumatic experience. And we have the opportunity to speak into them and help them to develop the truth. The dangers of this phase are avoiding the story, believing that telling the story is in itself what's healed. And I would say it's not. It's not about just, oh, good, you got that out. In fact, it's not helpful at all. It's about how did this impact you? What, how does this play out in your life now? What's actually true? What would it look like to live this out if that were true? The final phase, and again, I want you to know that this is very fluid and organic. It's not like, oh, good, now we're moving on to phase three. It, it just, I think, can help us as, as helpers to kind of have these, this framework in mind. There does come a point where they've worked through a lot of the distressing traumatic memory. Maybe not everything. As I said, maybe you've not heard their story from beginning to end. Maybe they started by talking about childhood trauma, and they have never even talked about their experience with the trafficker, or vice versa. That's OK. But you'll start to see that the distress is, is decreasing. They've shared stuff. They've worked through memories. They're a lot more stable than they used to be. They still struggle. But there's not as many flashbacks or panic attacks. They're not, you know, relapsing. They're, they're just, they're kind of coming into their own a little bit. That would be phase three, where they're really reintegrating, or as Judith Herman says, reconnecting back into community, into healthy relationships, work, education, community life. Um, this is where they're starting to learn and use life skills. This is where they're practicing setting boundaries, conflict resolution. So this is the phase where you, you know, you're a little more freed up. If we remember Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we're kind of up there at the top, more in like that, you know, their self-image, being aware of themselves, as well as their self-actualization. So what does it actually look like to have a healthy relationship, healthy sexuality? Uh, what does it look like to deal with conflict within relationships? You know, these kind of deeper stuff that, like, you don't have the luxury to deal with if you're figuring out where am I going to work and where am I going to live. Now we get to really, like, play out the, you know, the healing process. And remember, it's still part of, it's still part of that, like, giving them the opposite experience. Um, they're having new experiences that are not distressing and traumatic. I want to refer to this again, even though we looked at this in the last section. Just again to remind you, if we think about phase one, phase two, phase three that we just laid out, this actually coincides with that quite well. Because phase one is safety and stabilization, where they're kind of maybe just separated from their trafficker, and they're, they're dealing with a lot of needs, um, tangible and intangible needs. 
they're kind of coming out of survival mode and working through what it actually means that they've been victimized. Then, you know, as they're working through memories, they kind of move from victim to survivor and they're sharing their story, they're having more clarity and doing so in the context of community support. And then that reintegration phase is where you actually, they, they get to say, well, like, who do I want to be? What role do I want to play in this world? And there's more empowerment to develop life skills, professional skills, education. If you are a clinician, I just want to kind of outline for you some themes that can be expected in your work with them. You can um, expect to address prior exploitation and trauma from childhood. It's important to address dynamics of power and control. Flesh that out. Like, give them definitions of these words. Talk to them about what that means. Um, use something like, I don't have it on these slides, but Biderman's chart of coer coercion, which is used to understand like terrorists, hostage taker, dictator, and, and say, how did you see these characteristics in your trafficker? And do all of this very slowly, repetitiously. Address their sexual history and their sexuality. Talk to them about relationships, their ideas of dating and love. I want you to keep in mind the therapy process is long, slow, and repetitious. As we've talked about in phase one and phase two, part, I'm sorry, parts one and part two of this webinar, expect confusion and trauma bonds, and that's a long, slow, careful, repetitious process to address that. Expect layers of complex trauma that they can at times be in survival mode and chaos. Remember to offer them the gift of choice. It may not even be what you agree with or what you think is best, but it's a gift if you are empowering them. Be gentle but truthful. And remember that education builds understanding. I want to give you a couple of quotes um, from my, my recent project. One of the things I looked at besides complex trauma was post-traumatic growth. This is this really great idea that someone actually grows beyond, not in spite of, but because of their traumatic experience. That is not in any way to, to say, oh, to glorify the traumatic experience. But it is to celebrate that when an individual can identify ways that they've grown beyond who they were before. I think we need this hope as we've sat in a lot of complex trauma over the three parts of this webinar. I don't live every day with my trauma on my back or in my brain. I'm able to live very normally and think about normal stuff, like the dishes need to be done or work that we have to do, or I don't know. It shows that the work I've been able to accomplish in therapy and will be in for the rest of my life, and I'm okay with that. I will always see things differently than most people. I see little things. And it's not like I don't see a big picture. It's not like I don't have dreams and like I dream and I see big pictures, but I also see little things. And they bring me a lot of smiles and happiness and I'll always probably be like that. And I like that because that was a theme in, this, in my interviews, is them describing how they are able to see beauty, to, to see deeply, um, to appreciate things on a different level. And another, Another quote, it's possible for someone who's been through extreme trauma to not be defined by that. Just want to hit on a few kind of concepts as we, we, we um, kind of leave this portion of the presentation on trauma-informed responses. Healing happens in the context of community. Remember that. That means whether you're an organization, you're a faith-based community, you're a, a community, meaning a region. What are we doing to be safe communities where survivors can actually heal and thrive? Also want us to remember this on a bigger level. Level We're pulling out from like, you know, how do I work with an individual to like, how, what's the context in which this is happening? Poverty, lack of education, lack of skills and opportunity remain the consistent factors worldwide that contribute to a woman entering into the commercial sex industry. So to that, I would say, if we're going to prevent human trafficking, 
We have to protect the vulnerability of women. We have to look at these factors here. If we're going to help a woman heal, what are we doing to address the poverty in her life? Lack of education, lack of skills, and opportunity. Because as long as they exist in an individual life, in a community, a region, or a country, women, children, and men will be vulnerable to being exploited. Without intervention, trauma continues to impact future generations. There's a few quotes I'll let out. Um, you can read on your own the, the PDF slide. I'm not going to take a long time to, to talk to you about the stages of change, but I want to introduce this to you. You may be familiar with the stages of change my, uh, model from Prochaska and Di Clemente. They actually created this to look at um, addiction through this lens of people being ready for change. And I think this is extremely relevant to thinking about the experience of the trafficking survivor. And if we thought about where she's at in her readiness for change, these are the stages of change that they lay out. And these slides, you can read on your own, because as I said, they're relatively straightforward, kind of lay out what you might expect of a survivor at these different phases where she's pre-contemplative. She's just, you know, not really quite there, ready for help. The contemplative stage is she's thinking about help. She's thinking that there's a problem. She's ambivalent, but she's thinking about, you know, moving forward in her life. Preparation stage is where she's really made a commitment to leave or to not return to the life or a trafficker. She's becoming more invested in counseling and group. She's showing more independence. And the action stage is um, where she's really much more engaged um, and really kind of re-engaging in a different way of life. Then finally, the maintenance stage is just kind of, you know, getting to a place where she's, she's out of the life, developing new skills, has a network of support, avoiding temptation. But we can expect relapse. Many will return to the life, will return to traffickers. It's related to a variety of reasons. And some of them, we as a society and social services need to look at that and say, you know, are we in any way, is the system failing them that they would be vulnerable to returning? Sometimes it's trauma bonds. Sometimes it's that identity that I and value that I found there. Sometimes it's lack of resources and lack of options and desperation. So the stages of change can kind of become a framework for you. I want to end our time together in just looking at some dangers of re-traumatization and re-exploitation that I think are important to keep in mind as organizations and individuals. This again comes from the research that I've been conducting right now. This comes directly from the voices of survivors as I've asked them what they found to be helpful and not helpful. Is sobering and something we need to look at? So on the left-hand side, you'll see the trauma in sex trafficking. May I just remind you, it silences voice. It takes away power or abuses power. It exploits vulnerability. It provides empty promises. It isolates from the support system. It exposes and strips identity. So how do we avoid re-traumatization with in-service provision? Listen to survivors. Actually ask them, what do you think? What do you want? How could we improve? What do you want for your future? Give choice survivors in the way you go about offering and implementing services. Be consistent and follow through. Do what you say you will do. Be collaborative with other organizations. Literally, I had a survivor say that there was an organization that she was receiving mentoring from and she said, I felt safe there because I knew that the mentor was being mentored and had accountability. My trauma happened in isolation. I felt safe knowing that this mentor was not in isolation. She had accountability. How powerful is that, that she picked up on that? Uh, our services should protect and rebuild identity. So think about these things. Maybe evaluate your services on how are we doing? How am I doing as an individual provider? How are we doing as an organization? With providing some of these, these things to survivors because we don't want to look 
like the trafficker or the trafficking industry and the way that we go about providing services. Here's another. The danger of re-exploitation. So remember, a trafficker demands a nightly quota, could be approximately 500 to 1,000, might be average, but rarely any of that money is given to the victim. The trafficker exploits a victim through online posting, pornography, making her or him a commodity. Victims are stripped of their identity and traded as objects. So how do we avoid re-exploitation and service provision? Well, for those of us who may um, utilize survivor leaders, so these are survivors that have entered into the anti-trafficking movement and want to be useful in the field. Are we providing adequate compensation for them? If we ask for their consultation, do we compensate them for that? If we invite them to speak at an event or share their story at an event, have we provided compensation or travel reimbursement? If we don't, it could very much feel like to them that they are being used. And what does that sound like? Who does that sound like? We need to guard against the survivor becoming the face of an organization or fundraiser. Again, I've heard stories through my interviews of times that individuals just felt that they were on display. Maybe they were, again, not properly compensated, and they were used for the fundraising purposes of their organization. I realize how difficult this is. Some of you are in organizations that have to prove to funders that we're effective. How do we do that while well, protecting the identity and the faces of our survivors? Because we could way too easily become exploitive in the way that we go about fundraising. And then what does that feel like? Remember how vulnerable and how sensitive they are. And remember the power that we hold. We must guard against tokenism. So this would be this idea where we, we have a survivor on our board, you know, as our token survivor who, um, you know, she's, we're, we're good, we're survivor informed, we're, tra we're trauma informed because we have the survivor that we talk to, but we don't really treat her as a subject matter expert professional, but it, she ends up feeling more like a token survivor. And then what? She's just kind of treated as an object for our use, our best. Have to look at this. We have to go to great lengths to protect ourselves and the survivors we work with from avoiding re-traumatization and re-exploitation. May I remind you in this work that self-care is extremely important. Trauma is contagious. There's a concept called vicarious trauma that basically is the negative transformation in the helper that results from empathic engagement with trauma survivors and their trauma material. If you work with survivors, most likely you are empathically engaged. You entered into this work because you care. You have a heart. You have compassion. You have passion. But trauma is contagious. As we sit with it, it is most likely that we will experience, as they've defined, disrupted spirituality, loss of meaning, and loss of hope. If these are some of the aspects of trauma, these things are contagious for us to start to experience these things. We must be intentional with our self-care to avoid. I don't even know if we can avoid vicarious trauma, but to care for ourselves well when we see vicarious trauma popping up. We may, um, we may also have our own personal history, which we are not disqualified from being a, a caregiver if we have our own history, but we must care for ourselves well if we have our own trauma history, um, because it could so easily be disturbed as we provide work for survivors. So what I would encourage you to do is think about your personal warning signs of stress. You look through the symptoms of trauma. What, where do you see some of those symptoms in yourself? Think about what energizes you. What do you do to relax or unwind? Think about self-care activities that are the antidote, antidote of the work that you do. What do I mean by antidote? Well, let's think about the work that we do. Let's think about everything we've been sitting in as we've talked about the complex trauma of trafficking survivors. It's dark. 
It's messy. It often feels complicated, unfruitful, evil, chaotic, hopeless. So the work, I'm sorry, the self-care that we do for our work needs to be the opposite of that. Order, life-giving, neat, pure, light. What are the things that you do even now on a daily basis that are actually the antidote that you can be mindful of how they are forms of self-care? I encourage you to make a list of self-care activities and identify somebody that can hold you accountable to caring for yourself well in this work. And finally, a very important aspect of self-care is supervision and teamwork. You cannot do this work in isolation. You should be an ongoing student in this work, but you cannot do it alone, and you need ongoing support in order to, um, to care for yourself well. That is it for our presentation. I want to, again, remind you of some resources, just some books that I think could be useful for you in this work, um, some other resources that are related to assessment, this is the website for the coalition in the Lehigh Valley that I am involved with. You can be glad, glad to look at that and some of the resources and events that we have. And I want to thank you so much for your participation. As we end, I want to share a few more um, pictures from my photo voice project. Um, it's the healing of trauma through the lens of a survivor of sexual exploitation. I picked out a few photos that I really thought summarized and captured healing. These are the shadows of six adolescent girls I mentor about drugs and alcohol at a juvenile detention center. I help to teach them to not live in the shadows of their secrets and pain anymore. Through my own healing and recovery, I'm able to help bring others out of the shadows and into healing. Restored innocence. Freedom. The mirror. Seeing beauty has now opened the opportunity to reflect beauty through my life. What do you see? How do these pictures say something to you about the healing of complex trauma for a trafficking survivor? We see beauty, we see purpose and leadership, we see light. Security, freedom, seeing things that could easily be unseen. Thank you. Thank you for your participation in this webinar. Heather, on behalf of the Pennsylvania Coalition Against Rape and all the many people that have listened to your presentations tonight, thank you very much for sharing your expertise with us. Thank you so much.